He was billed as the eighth wonder of the world, a legitimate giant of a man, seven foot four inches tall and more than 500 pounds. Andre the Giant was the greatest attraction the world of professional wrestling has ever seen, yet his appeal went far beyond the ring. With his humble manner and his boundless charm, Andre became one of the most famous and recognizable athletes on the planet and a genuine cultural phenomenon. Yet behind the celebrity, Andre was a man trapped inside a world he never created, and one that would ultimately destroy him. The man we know as Andre the Giant entered the world as Andre Areni Rosimov on May the 19th, 1946. His father Boris had migrated from Belgium to France in 1934, settling in Moulin, just outside of Paris. In 1938, Boris had married Marianne, a petite Polish woman who soon began producing offspring. Andre became the middle of five children. Boris was a strong, stout man who stood just over six feet tall. He worked the land as a farmer and soon put his children to work, cutting firewood, tending the stock, and other otherwise getting their hands dirty. At birth, Andre was 11 pounds, but there were no signs of abnormal growth during his first six years. Known as Didi as a result of his sister mispronouncing his name, he was a healthy, good-looking, and charming child. But as he grew older, his rate of physical growth outstripped that of his peers. This was especially noticeable in his face, where his jaw and forehead became unusually pronounced. At age six, Andre began attending school at a nearby Ussi Samor. He loved the social interaction and proved to be a good student especially excelling at mathematics. Already he towered over the other children, not only those in his grade, but also those in any grade. He dominated in most sports, invariably finding himself in the position of goalie on the soccer field. With his large hands and long limbs, it was virtually impossible to get the ball past him. By the age of 10, Andre stood at six feet tall and tipped the scale at around 200 pounds. He looked and moved like a full-grown man. On the farm, his father had discovered he could do the work of three boys his age, so Boris took him out of school and put him to work full time on the farm. The Rosimovs had little in the way of material possessions. They were a close family and the children were raised with love and dignity though. They simply learned to accept what came without complaint. So when Andre was taken from school, although he missed the mental stimulation and the association with his schoolmates, he threw himself into the life of a farmer, sure that this was to be his lot. The physical labor, coupled with Andre's unnatural growth potential, allowed him to develop a level of physical strength that stunned onlookers. By the age of 15, he was able to lift a car so that his brother could change the tire without having to worry about a wheel jack. It was around the age of 16, though, that Andre's growth spurt went to a whole new level. His height quickly approached 7 feet, and his weight went into the 300s. But his parents, they were not overly concerned about his growth spurt, and Andre was never taken to see a doctor. During his mid-teens, Andre began a woodworking apprentice. After two years of diligent application and study, he decided that the trade was not for him and went to work at a factory that made hay baling engines. But the monotony of working on an assembly line was worse than what he'd previously been doing. Andre had dreams of doing something different, he just didn't know what that was. With no other options, he went back to work for his father on the farm. By now, his incredible size was constantly drawing attention, and he became known as a local curiosity. By the time he was 18, his fame had spread as far as Paris. There was a wrestling promoter who got to hear about the teenage giant who was stronger than three men. He took the trip to Moulin and knocked on the Rosimov's door. He told Boris and Marianne that their son had a future in wrestling and the potential to make many francs. With his parents' consent, Andre began learning the fundamentals of wrestling and was taken under the wing of Montreal-born wrestler and promoter Frank Valois. He began on the Parisian wrestling circuit under the ring name of Jean Fair in honor of a mythical French giant. Andre worked as a furniture mover during the day in order to cover his expenses in Paris. After work, he could be found in a wrestling gym, slowly developing his craft. Even though pro wrestling then, as now, was more entertainment than sport, it was still necessary for Andre to learn the basic moves, falls, and holds that would create the illusion of violence while keeping him from injury. However, with his intimidating size and strength, it was hard to find an opponent who was willing to share the ring with him. As a result, progress was slow. Despite this, his sheer size and power ensured that he never lost in the ring. 
In 1965, Andre received a notice to report to the Army's draft board. When he turned up for his physical exam, the recruiters could hardly believe what they saw. A 19-year-old who stood over 7 feet tall and weighed 350 pounds. Despite his incredible strength and good health, he was deemed unfit for service for the simple reason that the Army did not have any uniforms or shoes that were big enough for him. Back in Paris, Andre met Eduardo Carpentier, a popular Montreal-based Canadian wrestler. Asking the older man to train him, Andre spent the next two months learning valuable ring tips from the veteran. Before leaving for home, Carpentier advised Andre to get in the ring as much as possible and build experience. He also promised that he would one day bring Andre over to North America, where wrestling was much bigger than it was in Europe. Meanwhile, Andre continued paying his dues on the European circuit. He traveled around Europe and even as far as Africa, developing a huge following. Crowds were overwhelmed by his sheer physical size. Then, as the match began, they were delighted to see how he overwhelmed his opponents. In 1969, Andre ventured off the European continent to wrestle in New Zealand, where he was billed as Monster Eiffel Tower. Then he went on to Japan, where he competed with an American partner in the IWF World Tag Team Champs. The pair won the title, and suddenly Andre was a world champion. It was while he was in Japan that Andre was diagnosed by a doctor with the condition that had caused his unusual growth. This condition was acromegaly. It's a rare disorder of the pituitary gland, which leads to the overproduction of human growth hormone. It was caused by a benign tumor, which, if it developed before bone growth was complete, would lead to gigantism. The doctor also informed Andre that life expectancy for people with the condition was 40 years. Andre told no one about his diagnosis, keeping the secret that, at 20, his life was more than likely already half over. But this knowledge undoubtedly spurred him on to reach the top of his chosen profession as quickly as he possibly could. Having now won a world wrestling title, he felt he had sufficiently paid his dues and was ready to take on the Americans. From Japan, he traveled to Canada, where he met up with Eduardo Carpentier. There he became part of the Montreal-based Grand Prix wrestling circuit, quickly making a name for himself on the basis of his size, charm, and surprising agility in the ring. He would often be paired against two or even three opponents at a time. In one-on-one -on -one matches, he took on undefeated such Canadian luminaries as Killer Kowalski and Butcher Vachon. In the same time as he was wrestling in Canada, Andre made frequent trips back to Japan, where he was immensely popular. There, he won the International Wrestling Federation's World Series, defeating established stars like Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson in the process. Andre's hard work in the ring was establishing him as a top international drawcard. In 1971, he was named Rookie of the Year by the Wrestling Yearbook 1972. His biggest match to date came in May 1972, when he was pitted against the 6'9 Mormon giant Don Leo Jonathan in what was billed as the match of the century. With 20,000 people on hand, the match set an indoor wrestling attendance record. Now, this match was going Andre's way until he lost his temper and thrust his giant hands around Leo's neck. When his locker room guys ran in to stop him from choking out his opponent, Andre tossed them aside like ragdolls. Eventually, order was restored and Andre was disqualified. He had lost the match but he had also established one of his key gimmicks. He was a lovable giant, but if you make him mad, he would turn into a killer. After the bout with Don Leo, Andre began adventuring south to the United States, where he would appear as a special attraction on the American Wrestling Association cards. Now it was time to reach out to the biggest player in the market, Vincent J. McMahon of the World Wrestling Federation. Vince McMahon was first introduced to the man who became his greatest superstar in June of 1973. Until then, Andre had been wrestling under the name of Jean Fair. McMahon's first move was to rebrand the Giant. No one in America knew who Jean Fair was, but they could all relate to Andre the Giant. As well as changing the name, McMahon also modified Andre's onstage approach. Up until now, he had shown remarkable athleticism. Now, he was to rely solely on his overwhelming size and bulk to defeat his opponents. Andre's first match under the WWF banner took place on March 26, 1973. He easily defeated Buddy Wolf at Madison Square Garden. The American audience had never seen anything like this giant of a man, and he was immediately a sensation. McMahon, well, he knew a good thing when he saw it, booking Andre to perform night after night all over the country. By keeping the big man moving, McMahon was able to prevent the novelty of the gentle giant from wearing off. 
everywhere he went. Andre shattered box office records. McMahon was careful, however, not to pit him against other top draws for fear of damaging their prestige. As his popularity extended beyond the wrestling community, Andre began to receive offers for TV appearances. In the late 1970s, he appeared on The Tonight Show and The Merv Griffin Show, and was featured in such magazines as Sports Illustrated and People. In 1976, Hollywood came calling. The writer of the most popular show on television, The Six Million Dollar Man, had decided to capitalize on the string of Sasquatch reportings that had recently been made. They knew that there was only one man who could realistically play the eight-foot-tall forest creature. And so it was that Andre donned a fur-covered suit and prosthetic makeup and battled Lee Majors as millions watched on television. To the horror of his legion of preteen fans, the six million dollar man was treated like a ragdoll by the Sasquatch. Andre followed up his first acting role with a mixed discipline match, fighting boxer Chuck Wepner in June of 1976 at New York's Shea Stadium. The match was a knockoff of Muhammad Ali's famous matchup with Japanese wrestler Antonio Inoki. Wepner had won fame as the only man to knock down Ali and had been Sylvester Stallone's inspiration for Rocky. The match began with Wepner taunting Andre while circling him and throwing out a few jabs, which the towering wrestler simply ignored. He was well aware that he could drop Wepner at any moment, but wanted to give the audience their money's worth. However, in the third round, Wepner managed to get a shot in that connected with Andre's face. And it was this that got the big man's attention. Andre snorted and then hit Wepner with an inverted atomic drop and a headbutt. He then picked the six foot three inch Wepner up like a rag doll and threw him over the top rope. The match with Wepner had been a farce, but it further cemented the legend of Andre's invincibility. In 1977, he was listed as Pro Wrestling Illustrated's most popular wrestler. Promoters from all over the world pleaded for him to come over and face off with their champion. Andre had many hyped rivalries and matchups during the period of the late 1970s. Perhaps the greatest was with Ernie Big Cat Ladd. The 6 foot 9, 315 pounds Ladd was a four-time all-star defensive tackle who went on to become a career wrestler. He developed a very arrogant persona and had a penchant for sticking his thumb in the eyes of his opponents. As a result, he was hugely unpopular and the perfect foil for Andre. The two wrestled regularly across the country in matches billed as Battle of the Giants. In in 1980, Vince McMahon paired Andre up with an up-and-coming wrestler who had formerly been a bodybuilder. His name was Terry Belair, but his WWF stage name was Hulk Hogan. McMahon paired him up with a theatrically sleazy manager by the name of Classy Freddy Blassie. Hogan and Blassie were marketed as the ultimate cheat team and the ideal antagonists for the by-the-book Andre. The tactic worked a treat, with Hogan becoming the most hated bad guy in WWF history. At 330 pounds, Hogan marched his way through the Federation lesser stars. The fans demanded a matchup with Andre, and in March of 1980, McMahon made it happen. Despite his in-character bravado, Hogan was terrified to match up against Andre. The very thought of working a match with the Giants made him physically ill. The matchup that resulted seriously injured Hogan. He recalled that Andre messed up my shoulder, screwed my neck up, and suplexed me on the head. It soon became clear that Andre had a personal dislike for Hogan. They traveled together to Japan for a series of matches. As they went around the country, Andre continued to taunt the young wrestler, sitting in the back of the bus, so that he could bounce his empty beer cans off the back of Hogan's head. Hogan accepted the humiliating treatment as something of a rite of passage. By the age of 34, Andre had become the biggest thing in the world of wrestling. But to those outside of that world, he was generally seen as little more than a sideshow freak. He was constantly subjected to the stares and jeers of the public, and then there were the discomforts imposed by his gargantuan frame. He suffered from agonizing back pain and joint ailments, and he could never find a chair or a bed that provided anything approaching comfort. And, of course, always in the back of his mind was the knowledge that his time was running out. He wasn't meant to make it past 40. Andre's appetite for food was impressive, but it was nothing compared to his liking for alcohol. He loved French wine and would often drink an entire case before lunch. During more than one all-night drinking session, he would knock back in excess of a hundred handles of beer. And even after this, he would show little sign of drunkenness. Andre and Hogan continued in their ring feud through the end of 1980, drawing huge crowds. But by the next year, Hogan had left the WWF over a disagreement with McMahon over his role in Rocky III. 
As 1981 began, Andre was at the top of his game. His rivalry with Hogan was soon replaced with an ongoing feud with the Mongolian giant Killer Khan. In a match in 1981, Khan brought Andre to the canvas, leaving the giant unable to get up. His ankle had snapped. Andre was out for several weeks, and the storyline was hyped that he was out for revenge. They met again on July 20, 1981, but the match ended in a double disqualification. Andre went on to dominate through the early to mid-80s. On April 7, 1986, he prevailed in a 20-man battle royale to come off the victor at WrestleMania II. Following WrestleMania II, Andre took a break from wrestling. After a decade and a half in the ring, his body was breaking down. The health effects of his disease were also compounding. During this period, he was given a part in the Rob Reiner-directed movie The Princess Bride. He played the role of the lovable giant Fezzik in what has become a cult movie classic. Returning to the WWF in 1987, Andre faced up to his old nemesis Hulk Hogan, who was also back in the WWF fold. At WrestleMania 3, Andre weighed in at 520 pounds. This put a huge strain on his joints and his lower back, causing constant pain. In the final matchup, Hogan defeated Andre with what became known as the body slam heard around the world. Hogan tore his latissimus dorsi muscle in the monumental effort required to hoist the giant overhead. Andre, though, he got his revenge in a rematch that was aired on the main event in February of 1988. He defeated Hogan and took the WWF World Heavyweight Championship from him. Andre went on for another four years, but he wasn't the wrestler that he had been in the past. His body was racked with pain, sometimes to the point that he couldn't stand without leaning on the ropes. Andre owned a ranch in Ellaby, North Carolina, and spent more and more time there as his health deteriorated. He was there in January of 1993 when he heard that his father had died back in France. He hopped on the next plane in order to attend the funeral. After the funeral, he stayed on to spend time with his mother and siblings. On the night of January the 27th, he died in his sleep as a result of congestion heart failure. His mother intended to bury him alongside his father, but Andre had recently revised his will, stating that he wished to be cremated. In accordance with his wishes, his ashes were returned to the United States and scattered on the grounds of his ranch at Ellaby. Back in America and around the world, millions of fans mourned the loss of the biggest and baddest man to ever step into the ring. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode of Biographics. If you did, there's a couple of things you could do right now. One is hit that like button below. Also, if you want more stuff like this, we put out brand new videos every Monday and every Thursday. So hit that subscribe button below. And subscribe button doesn't do what it used to on YouTube. If you actually want to get a notification about these videos, please do hit that bell button next to the subscribe button and that'll send you a notification every time, every Monday and Thursday when we put out a new video. Also, if you want to watch something else right now, stuff from the archive, over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.